Welcome back and now for the news in detail. We start a news bulletin from Turkish President Rajab Tayyip Erdogan, who has arrived in Islamabad today on a two-day official visit. Prime Minister Imran Khan received the Turkish President and his wife Amin Erdogan at the Noor Khan Air Base in Rawalpindi. Upon the arrival, the visiting President was accorded the Guard of Honor at the Prime Minister House in Islamabad. Pakistan's Foreign Ministry says Erdogan will hold one-on-one -on -one meetings with Prime Minister Imran Khan and the country's other top leadership. The ministry said the two leaders will co-chair the sixth session of the Pakistan-Turkey High-Level Strategic Cooperation Council. The session will be followed by a joint declaration, while a number of important agreements are expected to be signed. The ministry said President Erdogan will also address a joint session of the Pakistan's parliament tomorrow. Khan and Erdogan will address the Pakistan-Turkey Business and Investment Forum, hosted by leading investors from both the countries. Meanwhile, Pakistan has expressed serious concerns over Washington's sale of a sophisticated air defense weapon system to India. New Delhi is set to buy 24 Seahawk military helicopters from the U.S. defense firm Lockheed Martin at a cost of $2.6 billion. In a press brief, the Foreign Office said the deal between Delhi and Washington will further destabilize the region. The spokesperson Aisha Faruqi said the international community is fully aware of India's aggressive policy against Pakistan. She said the region of South Asia cannot afford an arms race. The U.S. has praised Pakistan's jailing of banned outfit head Hafiz Saeed in two terror financing cases. Yesterday, an anti-terrorism court sentenced Saeed to five and a half years in prison and a fine of 15,000 rupees in each case. The U.S. Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs said the conviction of Hafiz Saeed and his associate is an important step forward. It said the conviction is vital for Pakistan to meet its international commitments to combat terrorist financing. Hafiz Saeed and his associate Malik Zafar Iqbal have been convicted under Pakistan's 1997 Anti-Terrorism Act. Moving on, four U.S. senators have asked the State Department to provide assessments on India's uh, crackdown in occupied Kashmir. In a letter to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, the lawmakers have asked Washington to pursue India to end its lockdown of the occupied valley. They expressed concerns over the communications blackout and human rights violations in the occupied Kashmir. They said India has imposed history's longest ever internet shutdown by a democracy paralyzing businesses, healthcare and education. The lawmakers also raised the issue of hundreds of Kashmiris, including key politicians, under arrest for three months. The occupied valley has been reeling under India's lockdown and communications blackout for the past 193 days. U.S. Cambridge City has become the second city to pass a resolution against India's controversial citizenship law. Last week, Seattle City Council passed a resolution condemning the new law. The Cambridge City Council has asked Indian Parliament to repeal the law and stop a proposed National Register of Citizens. The resolution said the new act uses religion as a criterion for Indian citizenship. Meanwhile, Indian Union Territory Puducherry has also passed a resolution registering strong protest against the law. The resolution stated the Citizenship Amendment Act has caused pain and chaos among the people across the country. Turkey says it has killed 55 Syrian soldiers in northwestern Idlib province. The defense ministry said Ankara's local sources have confirmed the casualties. The attack comes after Ankara threatened to strike Syrian forces anywhere in retaliation for an assault which killed five Turkish soldiers earlier this week. Tensions are high in the region following clashes between Turkish and the Russian-backed Syrian forces in Idlib. Yesterday, Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan accused Moscow of committing a massacre in Syria. Russia rejects the allegation, saying Ankara is breaking its ceasefire agreements with Moscow. The Kremlin says Turkish troops are aggravating the situation in Idlib. The U.S. Senate has advanced legislation to limit President Donald Trump's ability to wage war against Iran. The bipartisan resolution would give Congress the power to authorize the use of military force if necessary. More in this report. With the tensions between Washington and Tehran not letting up, many believe war is still a possibility.
To guard against an impulse or accident making the situation worse, the U.S. Senate has passed the War Powers Resolution. The measure is meant to restrain the president's ability to wage war without congressional approval. Eight Republicans joined Democrats to support the resolution 51 to 45 to proceed to a final vote. President Trump believes the bill will send a message of weakness to Tehran. The bill's lead sponsor, Democratic Senator Tim Kaine, however, argues that Congress is only standing up for the rule of law. If we decide to go to war, we should do it based on careful deliberation. Um, some viewed this as, is it an effort to tie President Trump's hands? It's not really about President Trump. It's really not even about the president. It's about Congress. It's about Congress fully inhabiting our Article I role to declare war and taking that deliberation seriously. Some thought, well, maybe this will send a bad message to, to adversaries around the world. We don't send a message of weakness when we stand up for the rule of law. Republican Senator Mike Lee said Congress authorizing a military action against Iran shows strength, not weakness. There is abundant support uh, uh, for the United States taking tough positions with regard to Iran. And that as part of that, we want to make sure that any military action that needs to be authorized is in fact authorized properly by Congress. That doesn't show weakness. That shows strength. And I think that's the strength that's going to unfold as we debate this. Last month, the House of Representatives passed a similar resolution after the assassination of Iran's military commander Qasem Soleimani. Under the U.S. Constitution, Congress, and not the President, holds the power to declare war. In an effort to bring back some normality, Iraq has reopened Baghdad's bridge closed for months by anti-government protesters. The Sinag Bridge is one of the main routes leading to the fortified green zone, home to the government and diplomatic buildings. Iraq's military says city officials were able to reopen the bridge with the cooperation of protesters. Security forces lifted concrete barricades, stopping traffic from using the bridge. Later on, security forces clashed with the protesters, fighting tear gas and rubber bullets in an attempt to keep them away from the bridge. Nearly 500 people have been killed in anti-government demonstrations raging since last October. President Donald Trump has brushed aside the Philippines' decision to end the visiting forces agreement with the U.S. Manila acts the 20-year-old defense pact on Wednesday, saying U.S. actions undermine Filipino sovereignty and the judicial system. U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper called the move unfortunate, hoping it could be reversed or delayed. President Trump downplayed the snub, saying it would save the U.S. a lot of money. Well, I, I never minded that very much, to be honest. We helped the Philippines very much. We helped them defeat ISIS. Uh, I get along. Actually, I have a very good relationship there, but I, I really don't mind. If they would like to do that, that's fine. We'll save a lot of money. You know, my views are different than other people. I view it as, thank you very much. We save a lot of money. In China's Hubei province, 242 people have died from the new coronavirus in the deadliest day of the outbreak so far. China's National Health Commission says almost 1,500 people have been confirmed infected in the last 24 hours, marking a tenfold increase. 1,363 people have now died from the disease, while over 60,000 have been infected. What in this report? That toll from the new coronavirus is still climbing, claiming lives in China every day. The new approach to diagnosis has seen the number of cases dramatically increase, while the World Health Organization says so far there is no end in sight. We need to focus on the task, and the task is to contain the virus, to detect the cases, to treat the cases. If we keep doing those things, yes, we may see a drop in the number of cases, but I think it's way too early to try and predict uh, the, the beginning, the middle or the end of this epidemic. Officials in Rio de Janeiro have stepped up their preparations for any possible coronavirus cases during Brazil's carnival season. Panic and hysteria continue to spread. Government officials are worried. It's a concern because there is a great movement of people and large number of tourists coming into the country from all over the world. So when one thinks about it, coronavirus can be transmitted through drops in the transmission area, then yes, it is concerning. In Japan, another 44 people have tested positive on the cruise ship quarantined in Yokohama. The total number of cases on board have now risen to 218. 
South Korean custom authorities have broken up an attempt to illegally export 730,000 face masks. The government says it is stepping up its efforts to ease a shortage in the supply of the masks caused by the spread of the new coronavirus. The government said the confiscated masks are worth over a million dollars. Earlier, South Korea announced tougher penalties against holding protective masks and hand sanitizer. Anyone with too large a supply of such products could face a two-year prison sentence and a heavy fine. The new coronavirus outbreak has spread a sharp rise in demand for the protective face masks and hand sanitizer. The WHO says it is extending its global emergency for the Ebola outbreak in DR Congo for another three months. The UN Health Agency says signs of improvement are extremely positive. WHO Chief Ted Ross and Norm Gibriasis said one case of Ebola in an area as unstable as eastern DR Congo could create a larger epidemic. Earlier, the WHO said progress has been made to combat the disease in the country's conflict-battered North Kivu and Ituri provinces. The WHO's regional director for Africa said the country's situation is different now than a few months ago. In Libya, the Khalifa Haftar-led Libyan National Army says it will not allow the UN to use Mitiga airport in the capital Tripoli. The LNS spokesman Ahmed Mismari said the UN will have to use other airports because Turkey is using it as an airbase. Mismari said the Eastern Army cannot guarantee the safety of the UN flights to the capital. The UN says it is concerned that blocking the flights will interrupt its humanitarian aid operation in the country. The International Organization for Migration says there are over 650,000 illegal immigrants currently in Libya. It said the majority of the refugees lack medical care and basic services. It's time for a short break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Germany's far-right AFD party says it will sue Chancellor Angela Merkel for alleged abuse of office. The party claims the Chancellor coerced a state premier into resigning after he was elected with the support of the far-right. The AFD wants to file two lawsuits against Merkel, arguing her actions forced Thuringia's newly elected president, Thomas Kemmerich, to step down last week. The party's co-chair, Jörg Muthen, said the chancellor has committed a violation of the right of equal opportunities for all parties. Merkel called Kemmerich's elections unforgivable and said the result must be reversed. The premier of Thuringia called for the regional parliament to be dissolved after his election caused a scandal for accepting far-right votes. It has been 75 years since Allied forces bombed the German city of Dresden in World War II. Some military historians suggest the city had little, if any, strategic value. 75 years later, the trauma from the event still lingers. This report has more. Nora Lang was 13 when 1,000 Allied bombers dropped 4,000 tons of explosives on her city. She says those were the most horrible hours of her life. First there were sounds of bombs and then I thought, now tanks are rolling over our heads. The front line was not far. I thought, maybe this is the end of the war and at the same time I thought it's the end of the world. As a child, I thought that. Lang says she still feels the pain and anguish of the bombing to this day, but she's also haunted by the fact that scores of children in the Middle East and across the world are suffering the same fate as her. Is there no one to help us? That was our question. And we thought this cannot be happening. In my view, these are the questions to this very day those ask who have to go through something like this. Is there no one to help us? You are aware that it's not happening around the globe, so there must be many places where peace reigns. People must react after all. British and American bombers killed 25,000 people when they raided Dresden between the 13th and the 15th of February 1945. UNICEF has recorded 170,000 violations of children's rights in war zones over the past decade. That works out at 45 violations each day. 
The UN Security Council will gather on February 18th at Russia's request to discuss implementing the Minsk agreements. A Russian envoy Vladimir Polyansky says Moscow asked for a UNSC session to look at the agreements on their fifth anniversary. The Minsk agreements deal with disputes between Russia and Ukraine. The contact group on eastern Ukraine also met in the Belarusian capital Minsk to discuss a political settlement to the conflict. Ukraine's representative said the sides agreed on the first of the three new disengagement areas along the line of contact. She said the withdrawal of the armed groups and military equipment over the border remains the basic precondition to start a political process. The European Parliament has approved a tough opening position for talks with the UK on its future relationship with the EU. Members of the European Parliament passed a resolution asking Britain to follow EU policies. The resolution calls for measures to ensure Brexit does not cause gender discrimination and to avoid a crackdown on tax havens with links to the UK. It also demands a dynamic alignment of the country with the EU laws. The resolution says the UK should commit to fair economic competition to prevent European businesses being undercut by British rivals. Venezuelan well President Nicolas Maduro has called opposition leader Juan Guaido a traitor, blaming him for US sanctions. Speaking at a rally in Caracas, Maduro accused Guaido of asking the US to impose more curbs on Venezuela. Venezuela's Socialist Party and the government supporters marched to the Miraflores Palace to celebrate National Youth Day. The day commemorates a battle over 200 years ago during the War of Independence when the army sided with the university students to defeat the royalists. Maduro said the youth will defend Venezuela against the traitor Guaido and his anti-national motives. La the youth are defending our country against the traitors and turncoats that go abroad and ask for sanctions against the people of Venezuela. That's why I'm in agreement with your chant, but not only the one about Trump, but also about the guilty Guaido. 13 people are killed after a private bus collided with a truck in India's northern state of Uttar Pradesh. Witnesses say a bus carrying over 40 passengers hit a stationary truck from behind. Police say 31 others are injured in the accident near the Ferozabad city on the Agra Lucknow Expressway. They said the bus was going from Indian capital Delhi to the eastern state of Bihar. In Palestine, a continued ban on trade by the Israeli government is making life harder for ordinary people. The Agriculture Ministry says Israel has tightened its blockade on the agricultural exports, a stable source of income for many. Details in this report. Against a background of rockets, mortars and late-night Israeli airstrikes, a Gaza chocolate factory keeps going. The owner of the Alaris factory wants to export his products to lucrative markets outside, but cannot. All the trade that happens here is controlled by Israel. The Israeli government has been strangling the economy of the Strip with a trade blockade. Without lifting and ending the Israeli siege imposed on the Gaza Strip and finding a radical solution to the Gaza Strip issue, there will be no economic activity or economic growth. Everything from processed food to vegetables to clothing, Israel controls the goods that enter and leave Gaza. Since Palestine rejected Donald Trump's peace plan, Israel has only tightened its bans, placing extra taxes and fees on goods. In Gaza, the prices of rent, electricity and fuel are high. The raw materials come through Egypt and the Israeli ports. The transportation fees are very high, so all this reflects on the price of the products. Many believe if the ban is not lifted, poverty will get worse, encouraging extremism and radicalization. Lebanon has formally asked the International Monetary Fund for help to overcome its worst economic crisis in decades. IMF spokesman Jerry Rice said the Lebanese government has asked for advice on its economic plan. Rice said Beirut officials want technical expertise on the macroeconomic challenges facing the economy. The financial institution has not mentioned financial assistance for the country. The spokesman said any debt decisions are for the Lebanese authorities in consultation with their own advisers. Lebanon 
is on the brink of defaulting on his sovereign debt with the $1 billion euro bond payment due next month. Another weather situation from around the globe. That's all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news. Thanks for watching.